Shalom, everyone. I am Ron Cantor, the CEO of Tikkun Global, and it's great to be back with you on the global broadcast. I hope that you have a great new year, a happy Rosh Hashanah, and I pray that this teaching will have a powerful impact in your life. Okay, so today I want to talk to you about the holiday that we're all celebrating in Israel this week, Rosh Hashanah, which means head of the year. And um, it's not exactly a new year, and yet it is, and I'm going to explain all that uh, in just a minute. But let me just say this. There is a powerful revelation in this teaching, in this holiday, that sadly my Jewish people have missed for centuries. So let's get right into it. The Bible speaks about this holiday in uh, Leviticus 23, verse 23. And, and, and the rabbis had a real hard time understanding it. And, and you'll see why in just a minute. Here's what it says. The Lord says to Moses, or said to Moses, say to the Israelites on the first day of the seventh month, you are to have a day of Sabbath rest, a sacred assembly commemorated with trumpet blast. Do no regular work, but present a food offering to the Lord. That's it. That's, that, that's the holiday. What are you celebrating? Not sure. What do you do? Well, we don't work. There's some food involved. Thank God there's always food involved in Jewish holidays. Somebody once said a Jewish holiday is pretty much all the same. It's they tried to kill us. We won. Let's eat. And so, but, but in this holiday, there is no, they tried to kill us or we won. It's just, let's eat and blow trumpets or blow shofars. What is this all about? And that, that really tells you why the rabbis had a hard time understanding it. That what, 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 what does this holiday mean? You know, every other holiday in, in the Jewish calendar, biblical holiday has at least one clear reason why it's being celebrated. Some of them have two reasons or more. This one has Zero reasons. So what we're going to do is we're not going to look back. And I think that's the problem is that people were looking back. We're going to look forward. It's not a, 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 um, a holiday where we're commemorating something. It's a holiday where we're looking forward to something. And uh, we're going to find out in just a minute. Let's keep going here. So um, we call this holiday Rosh Hashanah, which means head of the year. But if you read the text, there is... Rosh Hashanah, it's not in the text, it's not in the Hebrew, it's not in the English. It doesn't say anything about a new year. In fact, the new year for the Jewish people is actually in around April time, in the month of Nisan, the first of Nisan. The Bible says that will be the first uh, month of the year, the Nisan would be. Now, we're in a month that we call Tishrei. Most of the Hebrew holidays that we we don't... Uh, uh, have a name for. We just come the first month, the second month, third month, etc. A few of them did have names like Nisan, but most of the names that we use today, like Tishrei, the seventh month, those come from Babylon. When we were in exile in Babylon, we adopted the names of the months, the ones that the, the majority that didn't have names uh, from the Babylonians. And that's also one of the reasons why we celebrate a new year in September instead of in the spring. Somehow the rabbis decided that creation began on the first of Tishrei. There is absolutely no evidence of this whatsoever in Scripture. In fact, the years that we're going to be celebrating, uh, you know, we, we are in 5, 7, I think 8, 2 this time. Um, that eh, might be close, but it, there, there's no clear scientific evidence using the Bible where we can come up to the exact year. We can get in the ballpark, but the, the dating goes back about a thousand years where it was, I believe it was Maimonides, one of the great rabbis who came up with this. Um, and there were some others before him, but there's, there's just simply no way to know. There's certain things that we can't account for in the scriptures, so I'm okay with it. 58, 82, let's, let's go with it. Uh, but there is no new year in this time. So why do we celebrate it? Well, it's also because we're in Babylon. In Babylon, Akitu is their new year festival. And would you believe it? They celebrate it on the first of Tishrei, which again is one of their months that we've now adopted. But we also adopted a new year. Now you say, how could you, how could the Jewish people, they go to, 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 to Babylon and they, they, they adopt their pagan month. Well, the truth is whatever, whenever you go into a new culture, uh, there are certain things that are just, they're, they're not sinful. They're not necessarily righteous. They're just culture. And so as the Jewish people, and, and you remember what God told through Jeremiah, Hey, go there, build houses. I know the plans I have for you. They're good. He said, blend in until I bring you back. So part of their blending in is they started celebrating 
New Year with the rest of the culture in the same way that Jewish people all over America, where I'm in right now, celebrate New Year not only in Tishrei, the first of Tishrei, but also on January 31st. And as far as I'm concerned, I'll take as many new starts as I can get <laughs> because I am an imperfect human being, you know, becoming more and more like Yeshua every day. New Year's are wonderful times for new beginnings, uh, resolutions, but I digress because this is not an actual new year. So what is it? Well, it actually means Yom, or I should say that the actual text in Hebrew, and this is where it starts to get powerful as we begin to understand what this holiday really is all about. In Hebrew, the name of this holiday is Yom Teruah. What does that mean? Well, Yom means day, Yom Kippur, uh, Yom Teruah. Many of our holidays begin with the word Yom because it's the day of. The day of what? Uh, the day of Teruah. What is Teruah? Well, we know that Teruah is is uh, it, it can mean shouting, it can mean the blasting of trumpets, the blasting of shofars, and um, we do believe that this was speaking about shofars, not specifically shouting. Why? Because he says right in the text that you are to commemorate this holiday with the sounding of the shofar. So it literally means the day of blasting on trumpets, the day of blasting on shofars, but he doesn't Tell us why we're doing that. A shofar in the Old Covenant, the Hebrew Scriptures, it could mean a, a calling to war. Sound the, the, the silver trumpets. I believe that's in Numbers 10. Before you go off to war, God says, then I'll remember you. It could be of impending judgment. It could be a, a communication signal. That's how the there was the trumpets and the shofars that Moses would use, depending on the type of sound, to bring the people together. So in some ways, it was kind of like your, your iCal message, message that pops up and says, you got a meeting, you get a Zoom. You know, it, we know that in the uh, old city of Jerusalem, that there was a, the pinnacle of the temple. That's where Satan took Yeshua to the pinnacle of the temple, that at this pinnacle, the, one of the priests would stand there every Shabbat and he would blow the shofar saying Shabbat is beginning. Why? Because they did not have Apple watches back then. They did not have iPhones. So they did not have, they, did, they didn't know exactly when Shabbat was beginning. So something like that. They would announce that Shabbat is beginning. And then this, this 25, 24 hours later, uh, the same priest would sound the shofar again saying Shabbat is over. But one of the most wonderful things that a trumpet does, and we're going to see this at the end of the age, is that it, it welcomes a king. It, it announces the arrival of majesty of a king. And that is what I believe this holiday is all about. I believe that going all the way back 3,000 plus years ago, God was saying to the people of Israel, I'm going to give you this holiday that you're not going to fully understand because it's pointing to the second coming of Yeshua. Now we know that Yeshua came the first time as a lamb. He comes back as a lion. He came at the first time to gentle, humble, broken in the form of man as a servant. And he died even the death on the cross, Philippians chapter two. But when he comes back, he comes back as Re Revelation 19. He comes back as the man of war who will then set up his kingdom in Jerusalem. And from there, he will reign all over the world. I believe that Yom Teruah, or what we call Rosh Hashanah in America, Rosh Hashanah, that that is pointing to the second coming of Yeshua. And uh, let's continue to look at that. Now, I want you to turn with me to Revelation 15. And this is uh, a lot of the, this insight I came to. As I was writing, did I say 15? Revelation 11. Revelation 11, 15. I'm not sure what I said there. And my keyboard was in Hebrew, so let's get it back to English. And a, a lot of this revelation I got when I was studying for my book that I just, just came out called, the um, I wanted to say The Coming in Time of Awakening, but that is a different book, called When Kingdoms Collide. Uh, the Lord, I believe, gave me this powerful revelation. I was struggling, struggling with how can God, because if you took it, listen to certain theologians like N.T. Wright, Gary Burge, they, they have great difficulty understanding how God can be faithful to his covenant with Abraham and, and the natural promises such as the land of Israel, and yet be faithful to his covenant to the ecclesia, the church, which is made up of Jew, Jew and Gentile all over the world. And it suddenly, it's like God just opened my eyes. And God began to show me that he is ruling in two kingdoms of, at once. The, there is a kingdom of man. 
And, and Yeshua talked about that. Remember they tried to trap him and they said, hey, Yeshua, should we pay taxes to Caesar? Because everyone knows Caesar is evil and certainly he's going to condemn that. And Yeshua, who was the a wordsmith, he, he was the one-liner king, uh, in addition to being the king of so many other things. And so he said to them, bring me what, some of your money. Who's... who's Whose picture's on it? Caesar's. All right, give it back to him. Render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, but render unto God that which is God. Do, do you see what he's saying here? Is that you have responsibilities in the kingdom of man, and you have responsibilities in the kingdom of God. So we cast out demons, we preach the gospel, we pray for the sick, we worship in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of man, we obey government, we pay our taxes, we are good witnesses in the kingdom of man of the kingdom of God. We are literally in two kingdoms at the same time. Yeshua said that, but Paul also speaks about this in Romans chapter 11, where he talks about us as believers, reminding us that despite the fact that we're children of the king and that we have a, a, a authority from Yeshua, we also have responsibilities to earthly governments. And so what happens here in, in Revelation chapter 11, this is at the end of the age. And this is at the very last trumpet. By the way, this is one of the reasons I, I have difficulty with a pre-rapture, uh, uh, a pre-tribulation rapture. Why? You can't have the last trumpet, because we know it's at the, the last trump that will be changed in twinkling of an eye. You can't have the last trumpet at, at the beginning of the movie, right? You don't have the end of the movie at the beginning of the movie. You have the end of the movie the climax of the movie at the end of the movie. And we know that the end of this movie is when Yeshua comes back. And it says that in Revelation eleven fifteen, the seventh angel sounded his trumpet. And there were loud voices in heaven, which said, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah. And he will reign forever and ever. You see, right now, there's a lot of kingdom confusion, I call that. There's a lot of folks, particularly here in America, that have merged together our responsibility to Caesar and our responsibility to God. And it creates kind of what I call uh, American revolutionary Jesus. If you look in the Bible, and by the way, throughout the centuries, theologians have tried to recreate a Jesus in the times that they were living. You have feminist theologians that have created feminist Jesus. You have uh, liberation theology, which is to come against oppression. They create a Jesus that his only focus was not necessarily to die for our sins, but to you know, confront Roman oppression. You have all these different, even in, in the homosexual community, they have created a version of Jesus that is cool with homosexuality. And all these different isms or uh, uh, causes, uh, folks begin to create Yeshua, Jesus, in their own image. I thought we would never do that as, as, as evangelicals, but I see many people creating what I call zealous Jesus, re American revolutionary Jesus that says, you know, don't tread on me, the image of a snake. The difference is this, is that the Jesus who came the first time, he did not come as a snake, but Psalm 22 says he came as a worm. Philippians chapter 2 says he came humble as a servant. And he teaches us to turn the other cheek. And you say, well, you don't understand what they're doing. No, I understand what they're doing. I understand that the weapons I have to fight with are not carnal, but they're spiritual. So I go into prayer fasting. Yes, I'll use my voice, particularly in a democracy where you are free and encouraged to use your voice. But I always want to be smiling, full of love, trying to win people to the faith, not necessarily positioning myself as against other people. I'm going to walk in love. I call it kingdom confusion. I wish we had more time right now to talk about it in the middle of writing a book about it. But this happens when people begin to confuse the kingdom of God with the kingdom of man. By the way, Augustine, the great theologian, he encountered this in Rome because just like some people in America today, they see America kind of like as the kingdom of God. Certainly many of the first pilgrims uh, and, and the, the Puritans that came here, they believed that America would be like the kingdom of God and, and that city on a hill and, and it would shine that light to the rest of the world. And while we are called individually and, and as the ecclesia, the church, to shine that light, there is no nation on earth 
today that is the kingdom of God. Not America, not Israel. There is no nation that represents the kingdom of God. Now, why was Augustine concerned about this? Because he had, a, in his day, Rome had become the center of Christianity. In 312, the first Roman emperor, emperor, well, he wasn't the first emperor, but he was the first emperor to embrace Christianity. He became a Christian, Constantine. And within uh, a few more decades, Christianity not only became legal, under Constantine it became legal, but then it became the national religion of Rome. And then shortly after that, people began to say, Rome is the kingdom of God. Rome is the new Jerusalem. And from Rome, because Rome controlled the whole world, but not the whole world, but much of the whole world. And they thought, saw themselves as expanding. And now that Rome is Christian, we are going to Christianize the whole world. And then it's the kingdom of God. And Augustine became very worried about this because in 410, Rome was sacked. Rome was defeated. And so he wrote this, this massive tome. I think it took him 15 years called The City of God. And, and in a nutshell, it was one, it was an apologetic to the pagans, because the pagans were saying, look, Christian Rome fell, that means that your God isn't powerful. And and Augustine said, no, 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 Rome is not part of Christianity. You know, as individuals we believe, but Rome was never the kingdom of God. He said that to the pagans, but he also said it to the Christians who were like, how, how could this happen? How could we be defeated? Honestly, many believers felt like that two years ago after the 2020 election. They were assured of a certain outcome. And when it didn't happen, they were shocked. They began to pray for the overturning. And again, that's what happens when you begin to see a political party or a particular kingdom as the kingdom of God. No, my friend, it is only when the only one who is worthy to respond to that trumpet blast comes back. It's only when Yeshua returns that the kingdom of this world, they then begin, they, they, they submit to the king, Yeshua. Let's read that verse again. This happens at the end of the age. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. The kingdoms of this world, they're now the kingdom of God. Not now, not today, when Yeshua comes back. Until then, we have dual citizenship, and that's why we celebrate Yom Teruah. We're looking forward to this coming kingdom. We're praying for it. We're longing for it. Right now, we are oppressed, like, like, like the world itself. The Bible says in Romans 8 that creation is groaning, longing for its redemption. We, too, we're part of that creation. We're, we're human beings in that creation who've been redeemed, and we have a deposit of the Holy Spirit, but we don't have the fullness of what's coming, but we long for it. We groan. So while we live in America or Israel or Russia or anywhere all over the world, and yes, we are citizens of those countries, we have a greater dual citizenship in the kingdom of heaven. And, and, and I want you to remember this because we're going to come back to this at the end. We are longing for our Redeemer. We're longing for the end of this oppression that this body that is now 57 years old, it hurts more when I wake up than it used to. And and, and it gets sore. And it's just, it's, you know, it's, it's an earth suit. It won't last forever. But that which eternal is coming. And I long for that. Do you long for that? Do you long for the hearing of that trumpet blast? All right, let's keep reading or let's keep going. So we know that that Yeshua came as a lamb, but he's coming back, Revelation 19, Zechariah 14, as a king who will make war against his enemies and set up his kingdom. Okay, so when he comes back, it is portrayed in scripture as a hostile takeover. It, 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 it is like an empire with an emperor. So you know how the Roman empire expanded or the Babylonian empire expanded, they would literally, uh, their armies, their generals would go out and, and the bigger they got, the more difficult it was to stand against them. And so they would go to a smaller entity, a state, and they would give them a choice. We're, we're coming in, we're taking over. You can either submit or, or we're just going to, you know, crush you. Sometimes they would submit. Sometimes they would fight back. Uh, sometimes some of the people would submit and, and, it, it, and some of the people would fight back. But in the end, the empire would take over. In the same way, when Yeshua comes back, he, well, we'll see this when we read Psalm 2, but he's coming back like an emperor who is expanding his kingdom. 
And it's in, in the best part about it, he's a good emperor. He's a godly emperor. He is full of love and righteousness, and he's going to bring peace to planet Earth. Now, Daniel portrays it as somebody coming who will have ultimate dominion. Again, he's comparing it. If you look in, in, in the other time, I believe it's in Daniel 7, he speaks about these four empires, these four kingdoms. And we believe that was the, the, the Babylonian, the Persian, the Greek, and then finally the Roman Empire. But then there is a dominion coming. Well, let's read. It says his, uh, he was given authority, the Ancient of Days. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away and his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. So he's coming as a king who is taking over. Now, there is going to be some conflict. If you look at Psalm 2, I want to encourage you that when this is all over, meaning this message, <laughs> not, not this world, but when this message is over, spend some time in Psalm 2 because Psalm 2 is a prophetic psalm about the coming of the Lord. It's about Rosh Hashanah. It's about that last trumpet, Yom Teruah. Because what often happens is the kings have an opportunity to submit to the new emperor and fall in line with him or to fight back. Listen, listen to God confront the kings of the earth. Why do the nations conspire? First one. And the peoples plot in vain. The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers together against the Lord and his Messiah. So the, the, the imagery here or the prophecy is that God is taking over, Yahweh is taking over, and his Messiah. And as they come back to take over, the kings, or many of the kings, they begin to gnash their teeth. They are angry, and they're like, no way, you are not taking this world. The big mistake on their part. It says, they, they are saying, they, these, these wicked kings, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. And how does God respond to the people he created fighting against him? It says, the one enthroned in heaven, it says he laughs. He laughs at, the, it's so funny. It's so funny. You're just a little king, Putin, or whoever you are. <laughs> you're just, you're just little, you know, look at the, you know, it's, it's like, if you remember the old things we'd see in sitcoms. Uh, this is more when I grew up, somebody would, a you know, little guy would want to fight some guy and he just put his hand on his head and they got to be swinging, but he can't actually reach the bigger guy because his arms are too long. Well, multiply that by a million. That's the kings of the earth attacking God Almighty. And it says that God doesn't laugh for long. Eventually he scoffs at them and he rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. You see, the issue is still Jerusalem. Can you believe that? You know, if you go back 2,500 years, when, when all of this was prophesied about Jerusalem via Zechariah chapter 10, a, 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 a cup that sends the nation stumbling in the end times, you know, and now here we are, I believe, in the end times, and the whole world is still fighting over Jerusalem. And even when Yeshua comes back, it's going to be over Jerusalem. Where, where did the, the, the two witnesses prophesy from? Jerusalem. They, you know, where do the, the Antichrist armies seek to defeat them? In Jerusalem, because they breathe fire. Revelation 11, they breathe fire. They cannot attack. They can't win. And it's only once they're removed that the Antichrist forces, Zechariah 14, the end of Revelation 11, that the Antichrist and his forces are able to enter Jerusalem. The battle is over Zion, the holy hill, the temple mount. And God says, I have put my king, my Messiah there, not you. And so that's what they're fighting over. And then let's keep reading. Um, I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He's, now, this is now Yeshua talking. He said to me, you are, uh, or rather, this is the, the Yahweh speaking, the father. You are my son. Today I become your father. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the end of the earth, your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them like pieces of pottery. Now, I want you to hear me here. We, 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 you know, ask of me and I will give you the nations. You've heard songs like that, right? It's not about world missions. I mean, I love the application. I'm, I am a missionary heart. Let's go reach the whole world. That's not what this is about. It's about Yeshua receiving the nations at, as his inheritance at the second coming, Right? We've already gone throughout the world with the gospel. Now he's coming back to take over and he receives the nations as his inheritance. The kingdoms 
of this world become the kingdom of God. By the way, there is nothing in the old covenant, in the new covenant rather, that you can't find in the old covenant. You find the second coming, the first coming, you can find the grace of God, you can find the plan of salvation. It's all in the Hebrew scriptures. It's more plain in the uh in the in the new covenant. But again, we see in Revelation about him coming and taking the kingdom. What we saw also see the same thing right here in uh, Psalm chapter two. Let's read to the end of the verse. Uh, into the psalm. And, and, and it's a final warning to the kings. God the Father says, Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth, serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss the son, kiss his son, or he will be angry, and your way will lead to your destruction. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. It's God saying, Guys, you don't get it. Kings, you don't get it. This, the, you're, you're just a king. This is my son. You know, there, there are angels, there are prophets there. It's like when, when Peter uh, is trans, uh, uh, Mount of Transfiguration, he's with Moses, Elijah and Yeshua, and they're all turned white. And, and Peter blurts out, let's go build tabernacles for all three of them. Not realizing that Yeshua is so far beyond Moses and Elijah, who we love. We love Moses. We love Elijah, but this is the son of God, you know, and, and God is saying to the Kings, Understand this, this guy's coming. He is the emperor. He is taking over the trumpet has sounded. This is what this holiday is all about. Let me just keep going a little bit longer. Um, and I, I, I want you to understand again, this, this mentality of a, um, of an empire, because one of the things that I told you that happens in an empire, or rather when an empire takes over a smaller entity, you know, let's take, for instance, the, the kingdom of Babylon, when they took over Jerusalem, what, 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 what could you do? You can fight back or you can fall in line. You could submit. So what many, uh, 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 what many do when this happens is that they run out, they run out to the emperor that's coming in or the general that's coming in and they say, we don't want to fight. We, we pledge our allegiance to you. You are the new commander, that old guy. We don't like him so much. That is a picture of the rapture. It's another reason why I see it at the end of the age. The picture, this whole emperor imagery, which Yom Teruah, Rosh Hashanah, is pointing to, is about us receiving our redemption, our reward, our new bodies. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. I'm almost done here. I love this passage. Now, again, I want you to get into your mind. Here's an image. The image is this. Yeshua is the king coming out of heaven. He's returning. What do he say in Acts chapter 1? The angels said to the disciples as they were looking Yeshua float away, just as he came, just as he left, he will come back. In other words, he went up, he's coming back down. He went up from the Mount of Olives. He's coming back to the Mount of Olives. We know that from Zechariah chapter 14, verse 3 and 4. And so he's coming back down here. Imagine that, that, that he is the one who holds the keys to our redemption, our longing to be free. We literally run out. We are so excited if we're still on earth. We are so excited that we're literally able to meet him in the air. Obviously, we're going to need supernatural help with that. But that is what is happening in the rapture, is that he is the new emperor coming down. We literally meet him in the air. We are changed. We get new bodies. And then we return to him. That's what would happen. You would run out of your city. You would meet the invading armies. And then you would return with him. Now, if you're saying, well, that sounds kind of weak. We're, we're meeting this invader. Well, I'll finish with that. 1 Corinthians 15, 50. I declare to you. Brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the imperish inherit the imperishable. Listen, I'm going to tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, meaning we're not all just going to die forever, but we will all be changed in, the, in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at when? Not the first trumpet, not the beginning of the seven-year tribulation. We will all be changed in a twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will all be
be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. We get new bodies. When the perishable has been clothed with in the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, meaning we will never die, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Uh, friends, do you see what's happening there? Is we... We're oppressed in this world, you know, and this is where I really, I relate to, there are culture world wars going on where right is called wrong and wrong is called right. And, and you feel oppressed because of that. That needs to drive us to prayer, not to militancy. There is nowhere in the new covenant where God calls us as believers. Now there are times to take up arms and we could, we, as nations. Nations against nations. And I could give you my whole theology on war, which lines up really with Augustine's uh, idea of a just war. But we do that as representatives of our nations. We don't, there's no such thing as a Christian war where you go out and can kill people. There is no such thing like the Crusades, where they literally went into Jerusalem and murdered in cold blood Jews and Muslims all in the name of Jesus. There's no such thing. When Peter cut off the ear, he said, hey, bro, people who, after he healed the ear, he said, if you live by the sword, you will die by the sword. The kingdom of God cannot be advanced by killing flesh and blood, by persecuting flesh and blood. It cannot. It's a different kingdom altogether. And it is advanced by the preaching of the gospel, by the planting of new covenant congregations, through the gifts of the Holy Spirit, not through violence. That's a different kingdom altogether. But we're longing for our redemption. We do feel uh, oppressed like foreigners in a foreign land. And what's going to happen? It's not that we're defecting. Well, we are defecting. It's not that we are not good citizens of earth, good citizens of earth, because we've obeyed Caesar as much as we could, you know, until Caesar told us, you know, you can't preach the gospel. We said, hey, Caesar, I'd love to pay my taxes and I'm happy to drive the speed limit, but I must preach the gospel. Do what you may. And many during the seven year tribulation will give their lives as martyrs. Many will be beheaded for the faith and they will receive their reward like Stephen. But here's the thing. We are oppressed. On the one hand, we enjoy the deposit of the Holy Spirit and we can worship God and we can enter into his presence. But on the other hand, we are the oppressed living in an oppressed world. And when we see our Savior coming, our Redeemer, Yeshua, the Jewish Messiah, coming out of heaven, we will literally have supernatural power to defect from the kingdom of this earth. The trumpet sounds. We meet him in the air. Our bodies are redeemed. We return with him for a thousand year millennial reign. Friend, get excited, get hungry, because one of the reasons that the Lord will come back for us, the oppressed living on earth, is because like in the day of Moses, by the way, Revelation and, and the Exodus story, they line up. I don't have time to talk about it today, but they line up. And one of the reasons that God came to Moses is he said, I have heard the cry of my people in Egypt. I believe that one day Yeshua uh, will hear from the Father and he will say, I have heard the cry of my people on earth. It has hit my ears. They are longing for your return. It's time. They're going to bring out that white horse. He's going to get on it. He will come back to earth and he will bring our redemption. That's what Yom HaTuruah is all about. It's about the sounding of the shofar. It's about the redemption of our bodies. It's about the coming millennial reign. Thank you so much for listening today. I bless you in the name of Yeshua. May this be a meaningful Rosh Hashanah, Yom Teruah for you in Yeshua's name.